Well, thank you, Shukrakarda, for the very kind introduction. It is a great honor for me to give this uh, prestigious uh, Emin Shah Memorial Lecture, especially on the special occasion of the 125th God Centenary of Meghnath Shah. And I am particularly happy that uh, this lecture is being held in this department where I was a BSc student uh, more than four decades ago and had the privilege of being taught by such followers as uh, Professor Amul Rai Choudhury and Professor Shamul Shengupta. So whatever little I have achieved in physics, that has been possible because of the foundation which was laid in this department. As uh, Prabhupada mentioned, my research interest is the sun, which also fascinated Meghnath Shah. In fact, his very first paper on thermal ionization uh, was devoted to the sun. It was the cycle ionization in the solar chromosphere. So when I was first asked to give this lecture, my initial inclination was to talk about the sun, with which I am so familiar. But since some of my friends knew about my interest in history of science, and this is Meghnath uh, Shah's 125th anniversary year, some of my arms were twisted to give a talk on this topic. And now I began a serious study of uh, history of science only about three years ago, and this is probably the fourth time I am uh, giving a lecture on uh, some topic related to history of science. So I remember that when I had to give the first scientific talks of my life as a BSc student, I used to become very nervous before giving a talk. So when giving a talk on history of science, I again become nervous like that. But since uh, it is, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a story which is uh, so dramatic that I hope that the intrinsic drama of the story will activate you, even if uh, my presentation is uh, not so satisfactory. Uh, so, uh, most youngsters would be learning, uh, who are aspiring for a career in physics, would be learning the basic research tools under the guidance of a supervisor at the age of 26. But it was at this very tender age of 26 that Meghnath Shah, uh, working without a supervisor, far away from the established centers of physics, uh, Develop the ionization theory and revolutionize astrophysics. Uh, okay, so the Shah ionization equation is a standard topic of statistical mechanics. And when I taught the statistical mechanics course for our integrated MSc PhD students at IIS. I covered the derivation of Shah ionization equation. So most probably it is also covered in the MSc syllabus of uh, Calcutta University and Presidency College. So maybe most of the physicists would be familiar with this equation, but I found that even most physicists, which was true for me also till a few years ago, do not know much about what was the exact nature of Shah's contribution in this field. Was it the person who first derived this equation? So it may come as a surprise to many that uh, Shah, Shah did not derive the equation. He was not even the first person to write down the equation. So this equation, which we call now for Shah ionization equation, appeared in at least two papers by Eggert and Lindemann before Shah's first paper on the subject. So this is a story which has uh, many dramatic twists and turns, which I would uh, like to describe. And since uh, uh, this is a public lecture, I shall not, uh, I shall avoid getting into too much technical details of physics, but I assume that all of you know that an atom consists of a nucleus with electrons going around it. So here is the sketch of the simplest type of atom, the hydrogen atom. And now it sometimes happens that the electron gets knocked off uh, from the atom due to some uh, reason. For example, some, uh, if, if that gas is up to a high temperature, some electrons get knocked off from the electron. 
And then, uh, the, the, since the electron has unique positive, unique negative charge, so if an uh, electron is lost, then uh, the remainder of the atom uh, has one extra positive charge. It is called the ion. And this process is uh, known as the ionization. And basically, the uh, uh, ionization equation uh, gives the fraction of atoms in a gas which would be ionized at a certain temperature and pressure. And by applying this equation, you can show that as you increase the temperature, more and more atoms will get uh, ionized. And eventually, at sufficiently high temperature, virtually all the atoms will be ionized. And uh, that state of matter is uh, called the plasma state, the fourth state of matter. So if you just know this much about a uh, ionization equation, I hope that uh, that will be sufficient to follow, uh, uh, follow my talk today. I may mention that uh, on this occasion of Shah's 125th anniversary, I was requested to write a paper on Shah ionization equation for physics news, the Journal of Indian Physics Association, and this paper is available at this website. So if I have to tell you everything which is in the paper, then I have to give a three-hour lecture. So in one hour, I can just uh, cover a fraction of the materials which are here. So if you are seriously interested in this subject, then I urge you to look up this paper. Um, uh, George Gamow wrote a book uh, with which some of you may be familiar, 30 Years That Shoot Physics, in which he discussed the uh, developments of physics which happened in the first three decades of 20th century. And now the term scientific revolution is often, uh, quite often misused and philosophers of science like uh, Thomas Kuhn have tried to analyze the concept of a uh, scientific revolution. But I would one thing that is complete in unanimity uh, that if uh, had there been a scientific revolution in the last 200 years or so, then what happened in the, in the first 30 years of 20th century in physics based on uh, uh, one theory and relativity, that was undoubtedly a scientific revolution. It is often not realized that uh, this scientific revolution was achieved by a handful of very small number of people working in a rather small region of Europe. So this about uh, 30 or 40 people who caused this revolution, they would often uh, gather together, let's like, I think, solve a conference and they travel by train extensively to meet each other. And in those days, uh, scientists also used to uh, write letters uh, 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 quite extensively to each other. So it was like a family affair of uh, this scientific revolution. It was like a family affair of a small number of physicists there. And it was considered that almost impossible that somebody from outside this region would make an important contribution uh, in the scientific revolution. And then suddenly three very important discoveries came from a newly established uh, physics department of uh, Calcutta University. The so Shaka ionization equation in 1920, both statistics in 1924, so all the Bosch has moved to Dhaka by that time, and then Ramon effect in 1928. So it is often not realized how unique and extraordinary this development was. So perhaps uh, uh, there is only one other physics discovery of uh, uh, that, uh, that much importance which took place outside Europe, that was the Compton effect discovered in US in 1923. Well, uh, this, 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 uh, this uh, human creativity is something uh, very, very mystifying. We often see uh, that this, uh, this uh, uh, sudden blossoming of uh, human creativity at uh, certain uh, periods of history in certain uh, region. So, for example, uh, uh, this Escalia, uh, uh, Sophocles, and Euripides in uh, uh, classical ethics uh, wrote tragedies which remain unsurpassed for the next 2,000 years. And again, uh, uh, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael in Renaissance Italy produced paintings which, uh, which continue to amaze us. So nobody has been able to give a proper explanation. Why is 
we sometimes suddenly have this kind of bunching of a creative genius. So only thing a historian can do is to analyze the social milieu and the circumstances under which this uh, extraordinary creativity took place. Uh, so when we try to analyze uh, how Shaha did his creative science, uh, we uh, encounter some uh, uh, very broad questions in uh, history of science and philosophy of science. So what is the nature of transplantation of science from one society to another? Uh, so what kind of difficulties a scientist working in a periphery away from the scientific metropolis space and what is the nature of or real nature of scientific creativity? So in this short talk I can only touch upon some of the issues. So the question is how do we reconstruct the history of uh, how Shah did his creative work? So obviously we have to read the original papers by him and, and also by other important contemporary scientists. But in original papers we often have, the, have, have a presentation of the finished scientific work in which the traces of the creative process are, 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 are often removed. So to understand the creative process, or oh, one thing which historians do, historians of science to do is to look at the private papers of the scientists, especially its correspondence with uh, other scientists. So luckily, thanks to Meghna Shah's children, his private papers and his uh, correspondence with other scientists have been uh, preserved, which unfortunately is not the case for C.V. Raman or S.N. Bose. So constructing a history of the creative work is uh, much more difficult. So especially I mentioned that uh, Shah wrote two very long autobiographical letters to Plaskett, uh, which have been reprinted uh, in the September October issue of uh, Science and Culture. We shall make extensive use of uh, uh, those uh, uh, letters. So here are a few basic facts about uh, Shah. Uh, so he was born in 1893 in the non-descript village of Shavratali, uh, not too far from Dhaka. And then in 1911 he came to Calcutta to study in this presidency college, obtaining B.Sc. in Mathematics in 1913 and N.Sc. in Mixed Mathematics in uh, 1915. And it is well known that Shottel Bosch was his classmate and taught both the MS, BSc and MSc examination and Meghnath Shah came second. So at that time, Calcutta University was merely a degree granting institute uh, 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 with no core de uh, departmental faculty. So if somebody wanted to do MSc, that had to be done in a place like a presidency college. But sir, at that time, Sir Ashutosh was in the process of establishing postgraduate department and since, since he himself was a mathematician with a great deal of uh, interest in physics, uh, Sir Ashutosh knew about the revolution taking place in physics and he wanted to establish a department where the, the, the new discoveries of, 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 uh, of physics would be taught and people would do research on that. So he knew that uh, Meghna Shah and Shottepoch were very brilliant students who had uh, interest in physics uh, in spite of being mathematics students. So he called them and told them that uh, he would offer them jobs in physics department of Calcutta University if they agreed to teach this modern developments of physics. So Shah was asked to teach quantum theory and Bosch was asked to teach relativity. So they agreed on the condition that uh, they would be given one year's time uh, for preparation. And along with teaching, Shah and Bosch also started, uh, 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 started uh, their own research without any uh, supervisor. They were just completely self-trained. So if one looks at the titles of uh, Shah's first few papers, then one realizes that Shah was working in very different areas of physics and also these titles make it clear that Shah's first papers were like somewhat like extensions of uh, what can be found in advanced physics textbooks. So through this process Shah was trying to figure out how one uh, does research. So it took him about three years before he was 
able to find a particular niche area in which he could quickly become the world leader. So Shah has uh, given an account of his research preparation in his letter to Blasquet. So I began from 1960 to read rather desultorily any book on physics, mathematics, and astronomy and astrophysics which came in my way or could be found in the laboratory of my old college, residency college, Calcutta, or in the library of Calcutta University. I might add that I had begun to learn German privately as early as 1911 while I was a student in the inter-science class and by 1916, I had enough proficiencies to study scientific papers without the use of a dictionary. In course of these studies, I came across Ms. Agnes Clark's two books on astrophysics, one on the sun, the other on stars, and this excited my interest in astrophysics and made me familiar with some of its problems. A year later, in 1917, Calcutta University opened MSc classes in mathematics and physics, and I was asked to teach an old assortment of subjects, thermodynamics, spectroscopy, figure of the art, and was given charge of the heat laboratory. I was asked to teach thermodynamics because no one else of my colleagues would agree to take up that unpleasant subject as they styled it. I had read no book on the subject previously. So as we, uh, we shall see soon that uh, Shah's work on the thermal organization required knowledge of several completely disconnected areas of science, chemical equilibrium theory, atomic physics experiments, and stellar spectroscopy. So normally in a, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a conventional center of uh, physics, a young student would be trained as a professor would be expected to focus narrowly from the beginning and mainly learn uh, the supervisor's research interest. It would be very unlikely uh, for, 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 a, for, a, for a student with a conventional training in uh, physics to know something about uh, all these various disconnected areas of science. So it was basically this Shah's habit of reading desultorily, which made, uh, gave Shah a knowledge of all these different fields. And as we shall see soon, that was necessary for the famous synthetic work he was, uh, he was to do soon. So now let us come to the science. So it was in 1911 that Rutherford established the nuclear model of the atom. And soon it was uh, realized that, uh, that, that, that uh, some electrons can come out of that uh, causing ionization. And in fact, it was of great interest to astrophysicists because at that time Eddington was uh, developing models of stars. And he knew that uh, it would be particularly easy to develop a model of a star if the material inside the star obeyed the ideal gas law. Now we know that the uh, density, uh, estimate that the density inside the sun is uh, several times the uh, density of water. So it was initially believed that uh, the material in the interior of the star would be in the solid, or in the, in the interior of the sun would be in the solid state. And if that were the case, then it would have been very, very difficult to make a, build a stellar model because a solid state is uh, much more difficult to handle than the, than, 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 the, than the gaseous state. But Eddington realized that if uh, uh, that high temperature in the interior of the sun, if uh, some of the atoms are ionized, then that material obey the ideal gas law, and then building stellar models would be much easier. So in a famous 1917 paper, Eddington wrote of the hypothesis that the atoms are highly ionized so that most or all of the electrons outside the nucleus have been broken off and moved as independent particles. This suggestion that at these high temperatures we are concerned with particles smaller than the atom was made to be independently by Neumann, Jinx, and Lindemann. By an argument which now appears insufficient, I had supposed that the atomic disintegration, though undoubtedly occurring, would not have proceeded very far, 
or teams has convinced me that a rather extreme state of disintegration is possible and indeed seems more plausible. So now the pressing question was to do a real rigorous quantitative calculation and show that Eddington's gas is correct that material would be completely ionized in the interior of a, of a, of a, of a star. So now let us consider the ionization of calcium. So suppose the calcium atom uh, absorbs some uh, energy U and uh, gets broken up into calcium ion and electron. So this is very similar to a chemical reaction that molecules A, B, and C absorb some amount of heat U and get converted into um, other molecules A, M, O, etc. Now if this uh, uh, reaction is reversible, then we expect that it will reach an equilibrium when the rate of forward reaction and the rate of backward reaction will balance each other. And when uh, after that happens, the concentration of uh, various uh, substances taking part in this, in this, in this uh, 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 reaction will not change anymore. So the theory of such chemical equilibrium was uh, developed by scientists like Gibbs and Nance. And it was John Eckhart who first realized that uh, this uh, ionization reaction is very similar to chemical reaction and it should be possible to apply the theory of chemical reaction uh, to, this, uh, to this problem of uh, ionization. And here I show a part of uh, uh, a large paper where he writes down the uh, basic equation. Here it is. And those of you who are familiar with Shaha ionization equation will realize that it is a form of Shaha ionization equation written in terms of the logarithm. So John Eckhart called it Nance shape formula, uh, Nance's formula, which Nance had uh, written down uh, in, in, in is a famous uh, book on uh, the heat theorem. And here you can see U0, which is the, 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 this heat of reaction. So in order to do a quantitative calculation with this equation, one needs to know the value of U0. And Eckhart realized that uh, in the case of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen U0 would be given by the energy uh, which is uh, which you have to give to a hydrogen atom to move the electron uh, from the uh, innermost bore radius to, 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 to outside the atom. So Eckhart was uh, able to calculate uh, this ionization of hydrogen and found that its size starts at a high temperature, hydrogen will be fully ionized. But uh, Eckhart uh, had no idea how to get U0 for any other element uh, besides hydrogen, so he could not do the calculation for any other substance. So now, of course, we know that hydrogen is the most abundant element inside a star, but at that, this, this time, 100 years ago, most astronomers thought that the composition of stars is very much like the composition of the Earth. So it has of tremendous importance to, uh, to, to, to uh, calculate the ionization of the other elements, which uh, Meghna Shah was the first person to do. But before coming to that work, let me say a few words about the other predecessor of Shah, Frederick Lindemann. And here is a part of his paper. And again, you see that uh, this, 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 uh, this ionization equation appears there. So what uh, Lindemann was doing was studying uh, uh, magnetic storm. Uh, so uh, these are phenomena in which suddenly the Earth's uh, magnetic field changes. And a few years ago, astronomers had discovered that there are sometimes uh, some violent explosions on the sun called solar flares. And it was found that uh, magnetic storms typically take place uh, some two or three uh, days after, the, after, after a big uh, solar flare. Uh, uh, so this question was uh, to understand how this, uh, this uh, solar explosion caused this magnetic storm. So the Indian uh, suggested hypothesis that in a solar explosion, an approximate equal number of positive and negative ions are projected from the sun in something of the form of a cloud and that these are the cause 
of uh, magnetic storms and Aroli. So in uh, uh, present day language, we would say that uh, during a uh, solar explosion, uh, this, this large chunks of plasma are uh, thrown out uh, from the uh, 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 thrown out from the sun. So uh, to, to, to substantiate this hypothesis, one has to show that uh, that 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 the material in the solar atmosphere could be ionized and in the plasma state. And using this equation, the Neman showed that uh, that the material, uh, the solar surface is in the plasma state, or uh, the hydrogen at the solar surface is in the plasma state. So that Eckhart he also could do the calculation only for hydrogen. He did not know how to do the calculation for any other elements. And then he mentioned that the coronal mass ejections were discovered half a century after Lindemann's work. So now we know that uh, during a solar expression, really such blocks of plasma are thrown from the sun. And when they reach the earth, they cause the, uh, uh, this magnetic storm. So Lindemann's paper should be regarded as the first theoretical prediction of coronal mass ejection. But it seems that uh, this paper is not known much among the present practitioners of uh, solar physics. So in reviews of uh, coronal mass ejection, this paper is, uh, is, is rarely cited. And I may mention that apart from anticipating Meghnad Shah, uh, Lindemann had another very unfortunate uh, connection with India. So in later life he was raised to PRH as the Lord Cherwell and he became the scientific advisor of uh, Winston Churchill during the Second World War. And basically he who persuaded Winston Churchill to adopt certain policies which led to the terrible 1943 Bengal famine, Onchashe Mangnanda. So I have often wondered whether Shah had any correspondence with Lindemann in later life or whether he knew that Lindemann was probably the main person responsible for Ponchash and Mangnanda. So I do not know the answer to that question. Anyway, so now let me come to Shah's own work. So Shah presented the uh, theory of thermal ionization in a series of uh, four great papers which are all written when uh, Shaha was a lecturer in Calcutta University and they were all submitted from Calcutta. But just after the submission of this paper, Shaha was able to go to Europe with a scholarship and he joined the uh, laboratory of Alfred Fowler at uh, Imperial College London. So his uh, uh, first three papers appeared uh, soon uh, in, in philosophical magazine. They appeared soon after Shah uh, joined uh, Fowler's laboratory in Imperial College. But his fourth paper, which was also initially submitted to philosophical magazine, that was withdrawn. And then uh, Shah did an extensive revision of this uh, fourth paper when he was in uh, working in Alfred Fowler's lab. And then eventually Fowler communicated it to the proceedings of uh, Royal Society. So we shall now see what uh, Shah achieved in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, papers. Well, as uh, in, in the very first paper, Shah gives credit to Eckhart as a pioneer and mentioned clearly that he was building up on Eckhart's work. But uh, uh, Shah did not mention Lindemann because at that time Shah was uh, not aware of Lindemann's paper. And in fact, after going to London, Shah met Lindemann for the first time in a meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society. And Lindemann told Shah that he had already read Shah's paper, but I pointed out that he also did a similar work earlier. And then Shah uh, looked up his paper. But as I said, that uh, neither Eckhart or Lindemann had any idea how to do ionization calculations for any element other than hydrogen. They did not know how to get this value of uh, U, uh, this heat of reaction for any other element. But Shah had uh, extensive knowledge of uh, atomic physics experiment. So he quickly realized how to get this U for other element. So in his first paper, he wrote, the value of U in the case of alkaline arts and many other elements can easily be calculated from the value of the ionization potential of elements as determined by Frank and Hart's 
McClellan and others. So presumably Eckhart or Jim Denver were not familiar with, with this atomic physics experiment. And then Shaha also realized that uh, with this uh, theory of thermal ionization, one can more or less solve many problems at the frontier of, uh, of, 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 of astrophysics, any problems connected with uh, stellar spectroscopy, which was at the same stage of uh, astrophysics at that time. So again, uh, Eckhart and Lindemann did not try to address this question, probably because he did, they did not know sufficiently about astrophysics. So before coming to Shaha's work, uh, let me say a few words about the astrophysical problems which Shaha uh, tried to solve. So it was Fraunhofer who discovered that there are some dark lines in the spectrum of sunlight and then Bunsen and Kirchhoff uh, uh, realized that uh, these lines are signatures of uh, various chemical elements uh, which are present in the gaseous form in the solar atmosphere. So when radiation passes uh, through these gases, uh, these atoms of these gases uh, absorb the radiation at certain frequencies. And Bunsen and Kirchhoff also realized that uh, when these gases are heated, uh, they would also emit radiation at exactly the same frequencies in which uh, they absorb radiation. And now at the time of a total solar eclipse, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, sun's disk is blocked by the moon and we get radiation only from the upper layers of the solar atmosphere which is called chromosphere. So chromo is a Greek word meaning color, and since the light from uh, this radiance of solar atmosphere seems more colorful than ordinary sunlight, that's why this region is called chromosphere. So according to uh, uh, so Bunsen and Kirchhoff's theory, this the radiation that we receive from chromosphere, there we expect that there will be emission light and they should be at the same frequencies at which we see the absorption line in the spectrum of sunlight. But when astronomers obtain a subsidiary obtaining a, a spectra of the chromosphere, which is uh, during a total solar eclipse, something which is called flash spectra, the big, very big surprise was that, uh, that, that the emission had just found that the uh, uh, chromospheric radiation has been coming in some emission lines. But it was found that the emission lines, lines are as thin as frequencies different from the frequencies of these absorption lines. So this was a very big problem of that era. That, that is, does that mean that theory of Bunsen and Kirchhoff was wrong? So we shall see that Shah solved this problem in his first paper. But then uh, this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this problem, which is solved in his last paper, maybe I should mention that out of this uh, four papers of Shah, maybe the first and the last papers are the most important papers, which I shall discuss in some detail, with a few comments about his second paper, uh, this problem which he uh, solved in, a, in this last great paper was even more important. So even a casual observation uh, of stars makes it clear that different stars have different color. Some stars appear reddish and some stars appear bluish. And astronomers found that uh, stars of different colors have uh, different sets of spectral light. So this was a very big puzzle in astrophysics. Does it mean that stars of different color have uh, different composition? So certainly that did not make any sense. So again, we shall see that Shah solved this problem uh, in, in, in the last of his great papers. So now let us see what Shah did. So Shah's famous work was done at a time when quantum mechanics was uh, yet to be born. But the bohr sommerfeld model gave an account of uh, atomic structure and uh, periodic table. So physicists of that era already knew that alkaline arc metals have two electrons in the outermost shell. And uh, the bohr sommerfeld model uh, showed that, uh, that, that, that if an atom had only a few electrons in the outermost shell, then uh, it, uh, its spectrum will have uh, some regular features. So in astute intuition, 
Shah realized that uh, that that uh, uh, that the alkaline earth metals would be particularly helpful for his studies because before ionization, uh, these atoms have two electrons in the outermost shell, and after ionization, they have one electron. So either before or after ionization, they have uh, very few electrons in their outermost shell, and they are particularly useful for Shah's study. <coughs> And it was known by uh, physicists for a few years that when an element was put in a, in a spark and one of them was called a spark spectrum, it was found that the spark spectrum was at, uh, at, at somewhat different from the regular spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of an element. And it's pro it was a very mystifying thing because it was uh, first discovered at a time when atoms were considered indivisible entities and it was Norman Lockyer who studied this spark spectrum and tried to give some theory which uh, was not uh, very satisfactory. And Shah gave some rather ingenious arguments which are somewhat too technical to get into now. So with some ingenious arguments he showed that, uh, he gave convincing argument that the spark spectrum of calcium is, 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 is nothing but the spectrum of ionized calcium. And astronomers found that, 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 uh, that the, uh, that the uh, chromosphere had, uh, had, had only the spark lines of calcium. So when Shah identified these lines as lines of ionized calcium, it became clear that there will be ionized calcium present in the chromosphere. And Shah concluded that chromosphere must be a region of strong ionization. And in those days, it was thought that chromosphere is older than the solar surface because we were going further away from the sun. So now we know that there are certain uh, complications of, of, uh, for the, you know, the solar always hotter than the surface. But let me you not know, get into that, uh, those complications now. So since it was believed that the chromosphere was uh, colder than the solar surface, and one rightly expected that in a colder region, ionization would be less, but uh, Shah argued that ionization will be more in chromosphere, and that's why you see ionized lines of uh, 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 lines of ionized calcium. And Shah realized that Kesha uh, plays a very very important role in ionization, and in fact he presented uh, a, a, a table of the uh, percentile ionization of calcium in the very first paper. So he calculated what will be the ionization level for different temperatures and pressure. So here are the temperatures and here are the pressure in the unit of uh, one atmospheric pressure. Uh, so from this table, one can read out what will be the level of ionization at a particular temperature and a particular pressure. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the temperature near the solar surface is about uh, 6,000 degrees. So you can concentrate on this line corresponding to 6,000 degrees. You see that when the pressure is something like one atmospheric pressure, only a small fraction of uh, helium would, uh, calcium would be ionized. But as you go to lower pressure, something like 10 to the power minus 3 or 10 to the power minus 4, you find that calcium will be totally ionized. So Shah argued that as you go up in the pressure, the pressure falls, and as a falling pressure, the calcium is fully ionized in the chromosphere, and that's why from the chromosphere we see the many the spark lines of calcium. So suddenly there was uh, this, 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 this solution of this chromospheric puzzle, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which, which, which made people wonder whether the theory of Gunsen and Kirchhoff uh, was wrong. So after uh, solving this problem of uh, as, uh, alkaline earth metals in the, in, the, in the first paper, Shah turned his equate of attention to the alkali metals in, the, in his uh, second great paper. So you all know that uh, there are these uh, D-lines of sodium seen in the spectrum of sunlight, but apart from these D-lines of sodium, it is, it's, it is found that there are almost no other alkali lines uh, uh, present in the solar spectrum. 
So it was a big surprise. Does that mean that uh, alpha elements are not uh, present in the sun? So, uh, so now in alkali metals, we have only one electron in the outermost shell. So if that electron is lost in the ionization, then the effective innermost shell will be like a, like a closed shell. And for atoms which have such closed shell, uh, usually they do not have uh, spectral lines in the visible part of the spectrum. So Shaha are good that, uh, that, that it's not that alkali metals are absent, but most probably uh, they are all, uh, they, they will be all ionized and that's why their spectral lines are not seen uh, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum of sunlight. But then Shaha made a very really striking theoretical prediction. So by applying this ionization equation, we realize that in a region of sunspot where the temperature is lower, these various alkali metals would be only partially ionized. So he predicted that uh, it may be possible to see the alkali spectral lines if one looked at the spectrum of, 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 of a sunspot. So in a few minutes, I shall come uh, to the question whether, uh, come to this issue, whether Shah's theoretical prediction turned out to be uh, correct or not. So now let me come to Shah's uh, last great paper. Uh, so a group of astronomers at Harvard College, led by Pickering and Cannon, had classified all stellar spectra into certain classes, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So here I show the spectra of these uh, uh, various classes at the bottom of the spectra of the M class stars, and then you see uh, at the top uh, spectra of the o, o class stars. And it was realized that these are not some in like distinct sets, but there is a continuum. There are stars uh, with, with characteristics uh, between uh, two classes. So there is some sort of continuity. And as I already mentioned, the spectral lines for these different classes are found at uh, different frequencies, as you can see. So the big question was that whether the, the composition is different uh, for these uh, various different uh, classes of stars. And Shaha realized that it's not the difference of composition. Presumably these uh, different stars have a different surface temperature. And if they have different surface temperatures, then even if they, uh, they have the same composition, the ionization levels would be different at the surfaces of these different stars, and then the spectral lines would be would be, would be, would, would be quite different. For example, uh, if to consider the uh, line of neutral calcium, uh, Shah found that uh, that line was particularly strong in M stars, which Shah realized that were the coldest stars. And as it proceeded towards hotter and hotter stars, he found that by the time he reached B stars, uh, there's the neutral line, uh, line of uh, neutral calcium was not seen anymore. And now, if you go back and again to look at this uh, table uh, given in Shah's first paper, and typical pressure of a stellar atmosphere like is like uh, one atmospheric pressure. So you look at uh, this column, you can see that uh, that that by the time you reach a temperature like 12,000 degrees or 13,000 degrees, calcium is more or less completely ionized. So Shaha concluded that uh, for the kind of blue stars in which uh, uh, this line of uh, uh, neutral calcium completely uh, uh, disappears, those stars must have temperature like 12,000 or 13,000 degrees so that calcium is uh, completely ionized. So considering many, many spectral lines from uh, the, the, and, and in which class they first appear and in which class they disappear, Shaha was able to map this stress, uh, stellar classification completely to a temperature scale. So suddenly there was uh, an, an, an explanation of this of this uh, this spectrum of this, uh, this of this different stellar classification and that would be mapped into a temperature scale. So suddenly there was an immediate big impact of uh, Shah's work in the world of astrophysics. There are uh, in several astrophysicists in different countries who immediately started doing research based on uh, Shah's work. So here I show the beginning of a paper 
by one great American astrophysicist, uh, Henry Norris Russell, and here the beginning of a paper by two great uh, English astrophysicists, uh, Fowler and Newman. So probably you cannot read uh, these things from the back, but both this paper, the very first line, the begin by mentioning uh, Shah and Dr. Nagna Shah in an important uh, series of papers begins like that, and this paper begins Shah's theory of high temperature analysis, etc. So these were almost important papers written immediately following on Shah's work. And then in the textbook Theoretical Astrophysics, uh, the well known astrophysicist Rosland wrote. The impetus given to astrophysics by Shah's work can scarcely be overestimated as nearly all later progress in this field has been influenced by it and much of the subsequent work has a character of refinement of Shah's idea. And since I am giving this talk in precedence, maybe I should mention that at the end of this abstract which probably most of you cannot read, here it is mentioned that Dr's identification of uh, of uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, identification of sodium and uh, potassium lines. So here this doctor was Nikomoy doctor was Meghna Shah's college classmate and he was later uh, in residence college and he was the head of this department for many years. Well, so one of these uh, other astrophysicists were uh, uh, following up on Shahad's work. You may wonder what uh, Shahad himself was doing. So Shahad was less than 28 years old when the fourth grade paper had, had, had come out. So certainly you normally you do not uh, think or expect uh, a brilliant, ambitious young man of 27 to think that his base work was already behind him. Probably Shah also thought that after years of struggle, he has got a foothold in the scientific world and now probably would uh, scale greater heights. But unfortunately, that never happened. So after developing this theory of thermal ionization, Shah tried to do two things. First was the experimental investigation of thermal ionization, and second was the verif his verification of the theoretical prediction that he made in his second paper that the uh, alkali lines are not seen in ordinary spectra of sunlight, but uh, these alkali lines should be seen in the spectra of uh, sunspots. And uh, as we shall see, Shaha was not very successful in either of this venture. And I pointed out that uh, Shah could do this great synthetic work uh, because it required uh, an unusual uh, background uh, in the knowledge of uh, several completely disconnected areas of science, chemical equilibrium theory, atomic physics experiments, and uh, stellar spectroscopy. Maybe Shah was the only person in the entire world who knew all the, these, these, these very different things. And it is often pointed out by philosophers and historians of science that a lack of uh, formal professional training sometimes helps creativity. So this was Shah's example was certainly a really uh, remarkable uh, example of that, since Shah did not have a have a, have a have a professional training in a narrow area. So he was reading about uh, various areas of science and that's why he succeeded in doing this outstanding synthetic work. But once this synthetic work was done, the follow-up works would be done based by by, by, by professionals who were trained in uh, narrow areas of physics and Shah was uh, quickly beaten by professionals uh, in, 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 with such narrow expertise. So let us see that, uh, that the first about uh, this experimental verification of thermal ionization. So Shah realized that, uh, that, that uh, no laboratory in England had proper facilities uh, for doing this kind of work. And in fact, he had uh, extensive discussion with J.J. Thompson. And then he realized that uh, the laboratory of Nantes in Barley would be the best place to do such work. So he went to work in Nantes' laboratory in Barley. So he wrote, I had written to Egard, who was Nantes' assistant, and asked him to get Nantes' permission for me to work at his laboratory. 
I received an encouraging reply both from Eckhart and Nance himself and went to Berlin in February 1921. So just a few months later, in August uh, 1921, uh, Shahab wrote a letter to Sahar I believe it was a response to a letter that Ashutosh had written to him offering him a Maira professorship. So in this letter, Shahab boasted uh, that I have succeeded in experimentally demonstrating that gaseous atoms can be ionized simply by heat, temperature ionization of gases, an effect which under various forms have been looked for in vain by such eminent physicists as Maxwell, Victor, Raleigh, and J.J. Thompson. The experiment will shortly be published in the Zeitschrift for Physics and either myself or Professor Nance will announce it before the fourth time meeting of the German physicists at Vienna, where I also have an invitation. But surprisingly, uh, this paper which uh, Shah promised to Ashutosh Mukherjee, that paper never realized, in fact, uh, not a single paper ever got written out of uh, Shah's work in Nance's laboratory. So after Shah returned to India, he quickly moved from uh, from Calcutta uh, to Allahabad. And after he was uh, elected FRS in 1927, so he received a grant from the uh, governor of this province and, and in recognition of that honor. And with that grant, he was eventually able to himself set up uh, an experiment for, for, for experimental study of uh, thermal ionization. But again, the result was uh, not spectacular. There was only one short paper in an international journal with two of his students. And here uh, uh, they, they uh, 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 fabricated a harness for that part. So here is a sketch of that harness uh, from this paper of Shah with the two students. And as it happened, this, that this harness is still kept. Uh, in the, 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 the basement laboratory of the physics department of Allahabad University. So here yeah, in this photograph, you can see me standing uh, next to the furnace. Uh, as I said, that even though Shah set up this experiment, it did not lead to any very heart shaking or spectacular result. So now let us look at this other thing with, in which Shah was interested uh, this verification of his theoretical prediction that lines of alkali metals should be seen in the spectra of uh, sunspot. So Mount Wilson Observatory near Los Angeles had the best uh, facilities for uh, verifying Shah's uh, predictions about the sunspot spectra. So Shah wrote this letter uh, to this director head of this observatory. I believe that this theory, this theory is meant that, uh, that, that, that Shah had introduced his own theories of thermal ionization and then wrote that. Uh, these theories explain a good deal of the valuable data accumulated during the last 40 years by the American and English astrophysicists and besides open up new paths of investigation. I append herewith an account of some investigations which may be immediately taken up. I shall be very glad if someone at the Mount Wilson Solar Observatory undertakes the work suggested overly. My means are too limited and as my university is very poorly provided for astrophysical work, I see no prospects of ever being able to carry out uh, the ideas contained in my papers. So as it happened, uh, by that time, hell has, uh, was a tremendous, a very, very uh, important solar physicist. He had become a, a patient of schizophrenia, and at about the time when Shah wrote this letter, hell has to resign from the directorship of Mount Wilson Observatory uh, because of his deteriorating health condition. But luckily, Shah's uh, letter to hell fell in the hands of the great Princeton astrophysicist H.N. Russell, uh, who was an associate at this observatory. So Russell wrote reply to Shah on August 3. Note that date is uh, just less than one month from the date of Shah's original letter of 9 July. So Russell wrote, 
Dr. Kell has shown me your recent letter to him. Your predictions about the lines of alpha metals have been completely verified. Rubidium is present. We shall investigate. Uh, uh, in, uh, we shall investigate cesium as soon as proper photographs of the spot spectrum near lambda 8500 can be obtained. And in the next few months, uh, Russell wrote a series of very important papers in which he, uh, he, 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 he presented the verification of uh, uh, of of. Uh, of Charles various theoretical prediction. So he gave uh, the, 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 the very generous credit to Shah for being the pioneer and gift up of praise on Shah. So probably these papers produce a sort of a mixed reaction in Shah. On the one hand, he must have felt happy that his theoretical predictions were being verified and was being given the full credit. But on the other hand, he also must have realized that uh, uh, that, that, uh, that in this field in which you are the pioneer that has already come out of his hands and probably would never be a major player again. So I don't know that after that Shah worked in other areas of, of physics, but his, never, his achievements were never so spectacular as in astrophysics. So in 1940s, Shah again came back with his first love, the sun, and wrote a series of rather very embarrassing papers on uh, wrong papers, embarrassingly wrong papers on the solar corona. So I shall not get a discussion of those papers. But if you look at those papers, you realize that Shah had lost his, his magic touch. So this, uh, you get a feeling that contemporary astrophysics was keeping to the fingers of the man who was just a few years ago hailed as the father of modern astrophysics. So it was a very big puzzle to Shah's uh, admirers in the whole West why after this spectacular work on thermal ionization, Shah did not, uh, Shah almost disappeared from the scene like this, uh, this uh, like a spectral line as one went across the, 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 the spectral classification. So in Shah's uh, autobiographical letter to Plaske, uh, he described about his difficulty of, uh, of, uh, of working conditions in, in Allahabad. And it seems that Shah's letters were seen by several other astrophysicists. Uh, so after seeing this letter, Russell wrote to Shapley, another great ast astrophysicist and admirer of Shah, Russell wrote, I have often wondered why Shah's activity in the theoretical field fell off after his return to India and his account gives the explanation. His recent contributions to theory do not seem to me to be at all of the same importance as the old. His history affords a very good argument that the Indian universities and perhaps the government should be actively interested in securing proper opportunities for main or proven ability. So I leave it for you to judge whether Indian universities and Indian government has done this so far. But anyway, so since uh, it was uh, clear that, uh, that, that uh, because of the working conditions in Allahabad, Shah could not uh, uh, do, could, could continue to produce outstanding work. So there was again this big question that could Shah do his early famous work while in India? Uh, so since, uh, uh, as I mentioned, all these papers were published, uh, were submitted from Calcutta, but all the papers appeared in print when Shah was working in Alfred Fowler's lab in Imperial College in London. So that many of Shah's admirers in the West tacitly assumed that uh, maybe Shah was a student of Fowler and maybe these works were done under Fowler's supervision. So Shah was uh, very sensitive about this matter. And in fact, when Lasket mentioned something like this in uh, one of his papers, so that is what goaded Shah to write this long autobiographical letters to Plaskett. So after Shah pointed out to Plaskett that his uh, famous work was done entirely uh, in, in India, papers were submitted from Calcutta before he ever stepped out of India. So on uh, reading this, I think Plaskett immediately wrote back. 
So what was quite new to me was the fact that the early part of your work was done in India, not Germany, before you came to found us laboratory. The knowledge that you had done so much without help and backing in India only starts to increase the admiration I have always felt for your great contribution to astrophysics. And although Shaha had an exchange of uh, several papers in Russell, apparently Russell also had this misconception. So after seeing uh, Shaha's letter to uh, Plaskett, Russell wrote, I do not think I knew till seeing this letter how much he had done previously in India. So in this talk, I have uh, tried to argue that uh, the, the, the Shah could do and his unusual synthetic work uh, because he had the, uh, through his habit of uh, reading desultory as he described, he had a knowledge of certain, I think, uh, dis completely disconnected areas of science, which probably somebody trained more professionally uh, uh, could not have. And, uh, and I say that, uh, that uh, and, and, but afterwards, he was unable to compete when, with, with others when it came to a follow-up of that work. And I would like to conclude by saying that Shah's story is simultaneously a triumphant and a tragic story. The Shah showed what a person from a humble background in an impoverished colony far away from the active centers of, of physics could achieve through sheer intellectual power. But his inability to follow the trail which he himself has blazed uh, makes it clear that uh, that, that there are limits to what even exceptionally brilliant persons can achieve in science under very adverse circumstances. Thank you.